and then we have a few forward layers i don't remember if they're convolutional or fully connected and then we have the addition to what i talked about before that we have both a signal running forward in time and a signal running backward in time and the reason why we have this is of course if you have uttered a sentence then your interpretation of what is going on in the beginning of the sentence is affected by the end of the sentence so everything fits together here and this construction this so-called bidirectional construction makes sure that you can integrate at each time instant you can integrate up information from the past and the future so that means that you have these two recurrent flows and once they are uh, once they are completed then you send the information upwards to uh, to a feed forward neural network that will make the classification into what letter has been altered it at this time instant more or less like that you can also have situations in in uh, of course in speech where there's nothing being said but more or less like that yes so here's an unrolled drawing of this of this bidirectional structure so you can see now we have we have a little bit more of, of kind of things going on, but it's the same basic idea. And in this kind of drawing, we have a lot of weight sharing. And this is, now you can also see what I mean by a deep structure, because in the time axis, you have, you have like, you send a signal very deep. And then of course you can have at the output layer, you can have a cost function, for example, a cross interpret cost at each time step. So it's a little bit of a different type of, depth uh, definition in that in that respect also we can of course and this is done a lot of course is to you that you can have several of these recurrent networks st information streams both forward and, and backward in time have them uh, put on top of each other so that actually the second recurrent layer can get inputs from the recurrent layer uh, below yes okay so I already talked about Deep speech as a, as an a successful application for current neural networks, and a second very successful application of neural networks is within machine translation. And to perform machine translation, we take a sentence in, and we then, as an output of the model, we get a sentence out in a different language. So we need to define a recurrent architecture that can do this task right so that can take a sentence in and spit a sentence out and kind of a architecture that has emerged for this purpose is a so-called encoder decoder architecture so what is shown here is you have a sentence a cartoon of a sentence ABC in English let's say that then you also have a tag that tells the network now you are done reading the input sequence and when it sees the the, the end of sequence tag, it is then told now it should start decoding. And now it decodes a sentence in, let's say, French, uh, consisting of the words W, X, Y, C, and then it also spits out in the end uh, an end of sequence tag telling us that it has completed it, its translation. What is interesting about this model, so, so okay, so there are several things interesting about this model, but if you think about it, you can see that all the information about the input sequence is encoded in the last state, last hidden state of the encoder. So once it gets the, the first end of sequence, or gets the input end of sequence tag, then it has some certain hidden state, which is defined from all the uh, preceding sequence it has read. And that information is everything it has to go for on for to actually translate. So it has to memorize in that single state everything it has seen so far in order to translate. But it actually works to do it like this. There had there has been, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, uh, proposals for models that overcomes this bottleneck of having this last encoder state as kind of initiator. Uh, and all information carrier on, on the translation. I'll come back to that. But it's interesting to actually look at uh, what does this uh, 
last hidden state in the encoder actually learn. And here is an example from, from the same paper as I showed on the previous slide where they have inputted a bunch of different sentences and these sentences is then represented by a long vector, let's say there are a thousand uh, hidden units in the hidden layer, uh, the last hidden layer. And then you can of course not plot a 1000 dimensional vector for each of the input sequences, but you can project that to a lower dimensional space with, for example, uh, PCA or TSNA, and this is what has been done here. And if you look at these sentences, you can see that it actually has learned uh, uh, what is the object and subject in these sentences, and it has clustered sentences that have more or less the same meaning close to each other. For example, Mary admires John, is close to Mary is in love with John. So, so it's actually learning uh, uh, to place the data in, in some kind of semantic manifold where, where things that have similar meaning uh, is close. And this is of course, it has to do with that, otherwise it has not understood uh, anything about uh, language. Yes, another example of where we can use uh, recurrent models, this is a more like academic exercise I would say, but still a fun one, is uh, this paper called Learning to Execute. And the idea is that you represent uh, a computer program, here's a computer program written in like Python style, uh, as an just an, uh, a sequence of letters, so you take the whole program and make it into a long sequence of letters. 